Thank you very much. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for Mario and Litiana for inviting me to present here. Uh, my name is Andre. Uh, I'm originally from Moscow. Right now I live in Prague. And uh, today I would like to talk about, well, data and network security in iOS. Before we start, I would like just to explain a little bit. So this is mostly defensive talk, so I will not tell you how to break things. I will tell you how iOS protects data and how you as a developer uh, can utilize that, you know, um, iOS capabilities to protect the data. So I would first would like to ask you how many of you have any experience as uh, iOS developers or do, I don't know, manage iOS development teams? Okay, at least a few of them. I hope that this will be useful for you. You can still utilize this information that I present in a, you know, security evaluations, penetration tests of applications, but this is mostly defensive talk, not, not offensive. Okay, great, so today we would talk about data at rest, how applications can and should store data, and data in transit how applications send and receive data. So those are kind of two big separate pieces that we will cover today. First of all, you know, mobile application, if it's of any complexity, if it's not trivial application, this application must store data, user data on the device somehow. Of course, in the ideal world, and the best and the most secure solution is to not store any data at all, but unfortunately this is not practical for many applications. So let's assume that applications need to store data and they kind of need to do this securely, right? There is good news, right? Uh, good news is that iOS, since iOS 4, which is know, five years ago, 2010, iOS provides a lot of different features that help you as a developers, as a application authors, to protect user data properly. So you can see a number of features uh, I highlighted here, uh, and this is, you know, important. Each and every iOS device has its own uh, encryption coprocessor with a hardware encrypted, uh, with a specific device-specific uh, encryption key, which is hardwired into this, uh, into this uh, coprocessor. iOS devices, they uh, offer you and provide file encryption. They also provide keychain that you can utilize to store uh, application secrets like um, private keys, like passwords, uh, like access tokens, and these kind of things. Very important aspect of uh, iOS data protection is so-called protection classes. We will uh, look at this in much more detail in the next few slides. Next, very important aspect of uh, iOS data protection is, is um, you know, the fact that device can be protected with a passcode, which user needs to, to enter to unlock the device, and encryption on the device, encryption of files, encryption of keychain, it is actually tied to this passcode. This is very important. So this basically means that you cannot just bypass the passcode and decrypt everything on the device, because this is cryptogra cryptographically impossible. It's, you still need to somehow figure out the key to decrypt stuff. Um, next important aspect is local, local backups. We will um, touch on this in, in next few slides as well. Uh, the important part is that backups, which you save to your local machine, they can be encrypted. And all of this that I talk, to, talk about, this, is, this applies to all devices since iPhone 3GS, which is 2009, and all iOS versions since iOS 4, which is 2010. So this is not new stuff. This is mostly, you know, this has been around for a long, long time. Let's talk about protection classes because this is uh, very important to understand if you plan to utilize iOS data protection. So on the slide, you, you can see four protection classes that are defined for files. The first one is NS file protection none, which is basically unencrypted file. So you can, you can think of it as a file that can be read by anyone in the system, uh, which is not tied to any kind of encryption. The, the benefit of this class is that this, this particular class can be 
files of this class, they can be read at any time. So even if the, if the device is locked, so if nobody is using the device, if it's uh, on the table and the user is away, and the application needs to access the, to access the file, application can do this. Sometimes this is necessary for applications. So the next, um, the next class is NS file protection complete, and this is the exact opposite. So this file is encrypted. It is encrypted to both hardware key and the passcode key. And the good thing is that you know it's encrypted, and you need it's, it is only available when user is interacting with the device. So when the device is unlocked. Uh, and the bad news is that if your application needs to access file when the application, then the device is not being used by user. For example, I don't know, the, the phone is in, in your pocket and your application receives um, push notification and needs to access some local storage, then this is not possible because the file is encrypted to the passcode, which is not known at this time. This will result in an error and most, most likely application will crash if it's not uh, done properly. So. It is important to understand this, this particular feature. Uh, once the device is locked, uh, all the encryption keys that pertain to the, to the files and keychain items, they, are, they get removed from the memory. Again, this is, this is all documented. This has been uh, around for a long time, but it's important to understand and not all develop. I, I do work with iOS developers, and not all of them kind of understand this stuff, so um, I take time to, to explain this, okay? Next one, and uh, this one is probably the most widely used today, the next class, is NS file protection complete uh, until first user authentication. It's uh, bottom left. It is similar to NS file protection complete with the only exception that keys are not get, they, they do not get removed from the memory when the device is locked. So you can think of it like this. So when the device is switched off, the files with this protection class are encrypted to the key which is dependent on the user passcode and on the device specific key. When the device is started up and user enters the passcode for the first time after the device is you know, switched on, this key is computed and it, never, it is never erased from the memory. So basically, if your device gets stolen or compromised when it's off, then you benefit from the strong encryption, but at the same time, uh, once the user has provided the passcode at least once, uh, the data remains accessible. Again, this is a compromise between uh, NS file protection complete and NS file protection non, because it allows applications to access uh, files from the, from the background when nobody is inter interacting with the device. As I mentioned, this one is probably the most widely used today, so many, many apples, like, applications which are built into iOS, like, for example, contacts and phone and SMS messages, they use this class to protect their databases. And you know, many applications, most applications should use this class for their data. The last class is, uh, was, was added in iOS 5, as a matter of fact. It is NS file protection complete unless open. It is slightly different from all, from all others because it employs not only symmetrical cryptography, but also it employs asymmetrical cryptography. It permits the usage pattern when file, uh, sorry, when applications can create files even when the device is locked, but they only can read those files when the device is unlocked. Typical example is your camera application. So you want to be able to take pictures without unlocking the phone, and at the same time, you don't want existing photos to be available while the phone is uh, locked, right? So you can use this uh, class to do this. Basically, you can create new files without unlocking the device, but you cannot, once the file is closed, was, once the file handle is closed, you cannot actually read the contents of this file while you, uh, until, unless you unlock the device. And how is this impl implemented on the system? Like, Here's how, how encryption works at the file level. And it's important to understand that unlike, unlike, for example, on Android, iOS does not have this full disk encryption. So on Android, you have this uh, partition, and the whole partition is encrypted with a single master key. 
using DM crypt or whatever. On iOS, there is no such thing as, as disk encryption. Effectively, what you have is a file encryption, which is much more closer to things like encrypted file system in Windows, actually. So whenever a system wants to encrypt the file, it does roughly the same thing. So uh, this, the, the, this thing. So first it generates random file key. Then it encrypts this file key with the content key. And there is one content key for each protection class. So there is one content key for NS protection none, one content key for NS file protection complete, and so on. Uh, and this information, uh, encry encrypted file key and the class, those are saved in so-called extended attributes. Extended attribute is a feature of uh, HFS plus file system. It's basically file metadata. So it gets stored to this extended attribute. And the file payload, it gets encrypted with the random file key, which was generated earlier. So this way, um, system can use different content keys for different files. And application can specify which file encrypt with which you know, content key for which um, protection class. Okay, and this is how how system enforces that without passcode you cannot actually decrypt the file. So there is a concept of system keyback. System keyback is essentially just a collection of encryption keys of content keys, which are stored on the file system and they are stored in encrypted form. So whenever you want to, whenever a system wants to decrypt the file, it, do, it follows this, this process. So first, the passcode key is computed, and then like passcode key is computed from the, from the passcode, which is specified by user. And uh, also there is so-called key uh, 835, which is a device-specific key. So every device out there has different uh, device key. And those two keys are used to decrypt content keys. Okay, so this is why without passcode you cannot actually decrypt the file, because without passcode you will not be able to compute a uh, content key which, is, which corresponds to a particular prot protection class, and without content key you will not be able to decrypt the, the file. So it's not just some artificial you know, limitation, it's actually very, have very sound mathematical uh, proof. Okay. Next up, keychain. As I mentioned, Keychain is a system-wide storage which is designed to uh, store secrets. So files are designed to store you know, general data, and Keychain is a specialized database uh, which is designed to store more sensitive pieces of data like passwords, access tokens, private keys, uh, and so on. Uh, Keychain has been around for a long, uh, since, since the beginning of the iPhones. It's also present in uh, OS X on desktop uh, MacBooks and stuff. And on iOS, protection classes for keychain, they follow the similar pattern to files. So we have uh, security attribute accessible always, which means that you know the item is only encrypted with a device-specific key. It is not tied to the passcode uh, in any way, and so it can be decrypted at any time. It is still stored in an encrypted form in the database, but basically it can be decrypted at any time because Encryption key only depends on the hardware. Security attribute accessible when unlocked is the same as you know, um, file protection complete for files. These items with this uh, protection class can only be decrypted uh, when the device is unlocked, when the passcode is entered. And uh, accessible after first unlock, again, very similar to what we had for files. Once the device is unlocked for the first time after boot, this item remains uh, available. Encryption again is very similar to files. So if you look at the at the keychain, keychain is a SQLite database, and each record in this SQLite database is encrypted, uh, like shown on the slide. So we have payload, which is basically your password. We have header, and the header contains again similarly to to file encryption. We have item key, which is randomly generated. Item key is encrypted with the, with the content key, which depends on the protection class. Uh, so encrypted 
item key along with the protection class information is stored in the header in the SQLite database. This is metadata. And then your password or your private key or your access token is encrypted with the item key and is stored, again, in the same SQLite database. So again, it's relatively simple, relatively straightforward, and shows you that you know, without the proper content key, you cannot, you cannot decrypt the item, okay? And this is how key, key derivation works. So it is, again, very similar to what we had for, for files. The, the major difference is that here you can see that um, protection class always, secure, secure, uh, security attribute accessible always, which is the, the bottom one, it is not encrypted with the, uh, with the passcode key, and this is why it is available at all times. Everything else is encrypted with the, with the passcode and with the device key, and s as such, without passcode, you cannot, you cannot really decrypt this stuff. But then, uh, for Keychain, we have additional uh, protection classes. They are the same with the, like, but we add the suffix this device only. This is important in the context of today's talk because this, if you use, like, for example, security attribute accessible always this device only, this way you can ensure that this particular keychain item will not, will not migrate to a different device. There is a documented procedure how you can migrate uh, keychain items to a different device. You create an encrypted backup and you restore this backup to a different device. Sometimes, for some, some applications, you don't want this to happen. You want, for example, oh, I don't know, um, one-time password applications like Google Authenticator or something like that. You don't want to be for user to be able to clone those devices. So one thing you can do is use those protection classes. And as I will show later, in this case, the new device to which you restore this backup with these keychain items, it will not be able to decrypt those, those items. Again, there is a very you know, simple and sound cryptogra cryptography behind this. And a special, one additional special um, protection class that was added in iOS 8 is on the bottom right. It is security, security attribute accessible when passcode set, this device only. And um, basically, any item uh, with this protection class will exist only if device has a passcode set. So for some applications, it's important to ensure that a user can use the, the uh, application only if uh, device is configured to have a passcode. This is usually enforced using various MDM solutions, but also it is useful to have the ability to enforce this outside of the context of uh, MDMs. And this, is, this protection class allows you to do this. So you can actually create keychain items um, that will exist only if device is passcode protected. And when user, for example, resets, resets the, the, the passcode or, or disables the passcode, this item will, will be deleted and it will not be accessible again. So here's, here's how those classes work. This is, again, very similar to what we, what we saw before. Um, this device only, it doesn't matter for, you know, for local keychain, but it matters for the keychain backup. This is the difference between, uh, between this device only and without this device only items when you create encrypted backup. So when you backup your device through iTunes and your backup is encrypted, this is what happens. Uh, all the keys from the system key back, they got you know, re-encrypted uh, to the backup key back. And keychain items that have this device only suffix, they are encrypted using two keys. The first key is the backup key, which is computed from your backup password. And the second key is the device specific key. And this is why if you restore this backup to another device, it will not be useful. It will be actually useless and it will not decrypt properly. Because another device does not know the device specific key of the original device. So as, as simple as that. So if your application needs to ensure that keychain items created on this device will not migrate to another device, please use these protection classes. 
Uh, but this is this is everything you know. You probably, if you do iOS work, you probably know know this already. Let's talk about relatively new stuff. So uh, two years ago, a new iteration of data protection was effectively presented, which is you know iOS 7 and iPhone 5s, which is first 64-bit device. Very nice. So what we have new? We have Secure Enclave, which is a very cool hardware which is built into into device and can be used by application developers. We have Touch ID. We have uh, Keychain Access Control lists. Uh, this is all relatively new and very useful. Let's see. Secure Enclave. Secure Enclave, you, you, you can think of it as an embedded core processor which is baked into the iOS device. It has its own operating system. It has more than that. It has its own secure boot chain and its own firmware. Uh, it is available for all devices starting with a, a7 processor, which is iPhone 5s, iPhone 6, 6 plus, 6s, and 6s plus, and uh, iPads, some of them like newer iPads. And it's responsible for touch ID, for passcode verification, for um, decrypting content keys, and for keychain ACLs. What is keychain ACL? Well, Keychain ACL is a relatively new feature which is, was introduced, I think, in iOS 8, but it was considerably improved in uh, iOS 9, so this is relatively new. This is a feature which allows your application to specify access conditions for Keychain items. So, as of today, uh, there are four access conditions that you can specify. So, they are listed in the first part of the slide, so this is access control user presence, access control touch ID any, uh, access control touch ID current set, and access control device passcode. Basically what those um, control conditions say is that before returning keychain item to your application, Secure Enclave must check that, for, first, for example, for control user presence, Secure Enclave must check that the user uh, is actually, the original user is, uh, the authorized user is interacting with the device. Secure Enclave does this by requesting user to provide, to, to authenticate with, with, a, uh, with a fingerprint scan, right? And if user fails to, to do this, then Secure Enclave simply will not return the, the keychain item. So you can think, is this, uh, think of this as a two-factor authentication for your keychain access. So first factor is your application running on the device, and the second factor is that actually the user who is authorized to use this device, that this user is indeed who is using the device. So it's not somebody, you know, somebody took your phone and started your, the application, and the application then accessed these secrets. No, you specifically request Secure Enclave to verify that it is still the authorized user who does this. I'm sorry. Um, so this is user presence. Um, user presence is available on all devices. It will default to touch ID, but will fall back to device passcode. This is not, uh, for some applications, this is not sufficient. Some applications need to, you know, have more granular control over the ACLs. So Apple added new policies, new uh, ACL policies, which is access control touch ID any which will prompt user for uh, touch ID authentication. Uh, touch ID current set is very similar with the difference that if somebody enrolls a new finger, somebody adds a new finger to your device, then existing keychain items will be discarded. So this is protection from the scenario when uh, somebody configures the device, uh, the application with some secrets, and then somebody else adds his finger to this device. And items with touch ID current set will be destroyed in this case, and uh, it will be necessary to recreate them. Okay? And access control device passcode, as you can guess, is just, you know, requires secure enclave to prompt for the passcode. And uh, it will release secret only if the you know, user knows the correct passcode for this device. Another one, uh, which is slightly different domain, but also implemented as uh, ACL, is a Access control application password. Uh, it is 
It basically adds another authentication factor. Application can specify additional secret which is required to decrypt the keychain item. So this is shown on this, uh, on this diagram. So basically, everything works as before, but uh, application additionally needs to specify application password, uh, like additional secret, that is mixed to the generation of the item key. And without this, item, without this application secret, a person who, for example, compromises the keychain and uh, everything else, Without, the, without compromising the application in its secret. This person will not be able to decrypt this kitchen item. This is designed for, for, um, for scenarios, for example, when um, server can control access to the kitchen item. So this application secret, for example, this application password, it can be sent to the application from the server, right? And if you want to revoke a particular user from, you know, you know, if you want to stop a particular user from being able to access the secret which is stored on their devices, you just reconfigure your server-side application to not return this application secret to this particular user. So this adds additional control, additional layer of control uh, for the locally stored data. And this is important. This is provides, you know, defense in depth. So, of course, we assume this keychain is secure, but what if? What if it's somehow compromised? Apple provides an additional uh, mechanism by which your application can add your application secret, which application is responsible, you know, application is responsible for managing this application password, obviously. So, and this additional factor it kind of provides additional layer of protection for the data that your application stores. Again, this is new, this is iOS 9. This is not very well documented. Uh, you have to read, you know, here files. This is not documented in the documentation, but this is, you know, public APIs. So if you're developing anything, you know, cool, new, and you care about the security and privacy of your users' data, you should definitely look into this. So bottom line of this first part of the talk is that iOS data protection provides reasonably good data at rest protection. As long as we talk about protection of data on the device. But actually, uh, the very bad thing about, about you know, data at rest is that if application stores something on the device, then it is almost certainly that this data will cross the device boundary and will go to cloud, will go to you know, local backups, will go somewhere else. And this is something you also should be aware of. Right? Because, I mean, we live in a world where everything is in the cloud, everything is backed up to you know, a local machine, to the Dropbox, to iCloud, or whatever. And if your application stores something locally on the device, you should assume that this something goes to, to somewhere else as part of you know, backup and stuff. For example, this is how iCloud backup works. Uh, the, your device, I, I, iPhone, iPad, whatever, it first establishes encryption keys with the Apple server, and then it encrypts data and sends it to, to the storage services. Interestingly enough, for iCloud backups, Apple uses third-party storage, like Amazon, Windows Azure, and China Telecom, based on geographical locations, of course. And actual data is stored on those st storage providers. But Apple, Apple holds the key uh, for this data. So what can you tell from this picture? Well, I can tell that user is not in control of the data anymore because user does not hold any encryption keys for the data. It is Apple who holds the key in this scenario. and is Apple has full control of this data. User does not have any, any control. We can only trust Apple that you know, they will delete it when we delete the iCloud backup and stuff. But we have no way to enforce this. Bottom line, once data has left the device, user has no control over it. So it's important to make sure that we limit the exposure of the data. So again, iOS provides a number, uh, number of features through which you can limit the exposure of the data. For example, for backups, 
uh, for backups, it depends where you store the data, because some locations are backed up by default, some are not. So for example, the document subfolder is backed up, and the library caches is not. So think carefully about where you store your application's data locally. Also, there is an option to exclude particular file or directory from backup. You just use this uh, key and set it for a particular file, and it will not be included in the backup. So again, it is important to use this, to understand that you have the ability to use this. It's also important to understand the implications uh, for keychain items, the, the stuff that I have been trying to explain before. So without this device-only suffix, it is possible for you keychain items stored by your application to be extracted through the encrypted backup. So a person can do this. This is documented behavior, and there are tools out there that allow you to extract passwords, a keychain items, sorry, from encrypted backups, unless you specify this, uh, this suffix. So again, this is something you should understand. Another, another way in which the application data can be read is so-called file sharing. So we have some good news here, because before iOS 8.3, uh, file sharing was essentially enabled for all applications on the device. With release of iOS 8.3 a couple of months ago, well, actually about a half a year ago, Apple made very silent, I don't think they have advertised this, but they made very silent and very uh, brutal fix. They disabled uh, file sharing by default for all application unless the application specifically requests this feature. So unless you have a business need to do this, don't do this because file sharing essentially provides access to sandbox of the application, even to the files which are not backed up by default. So basically to all all the data of your application, including temporary files, including library caches and cookies and stuff. So handle with care, this is toxic stuff. And the last way to combat this situation uh, where you don't have control over data once it leaves the device is of course to use application level encryption. This is very similar in concept to the application password that we uh, have, what we now have for the, for the keychain, but this idea is applied to files. Unfortunately, this is not built into iOS. It's something that you need to implement on your own. Uh, the basic idea is that, well, your application encrypts data before writing to files. Even though you know that files are encrypted by iOS, you still apply additional layer of protection on top of that. So the downside is that application is responsible for encryption, key management, and you know, all this stuff, and it's difficult to get this right. Um, it's difficult to get crypto right, it's difficult to get key management right, it's, you know, it's, it's hard. The good news is that there are a number of uh, open source and paid projects that kind of implement this for you. So for example, SQL Cypher is a very good thing. It's basically um, SQL Lite with encryption capabilities. It's open source, you can use it. You basically, if you use SQLite, then you don't need to uh, remodel your storage model, your, you know, everything works as this. You just add additional function call to set the key. So, and the pattern that I propose to use is that your application generates random password, it stores it in the keychain, and then, you know, you use this random passwords to, uh, provide additional encryption for, uh, for files. There is an encrypted core data project that builds on, on top of SQL Cypher for, and pr tries to provide the core data stack. We had a limited success with it, so it works. There are some downsides, but you know, consider it. And there is, of course, a SQL, SQLite encryption extensions, which is uh, similar in concept to SQL Cypher, but from the authors of SQLite itself, and unfortunately it costs. It's not free. All right. Even though those open source projects, I would like to stress that you know, application still is responsible for key management and there is still room for error. So please handle with care. This is really, I mean, if, if you decide to go down this path, 
you probably should get it right. Uh, so please spend you know, some time reviewing and designing this uh, key management stuff because it will be very embarrassing if you spend a lot of time implementing application layer encryption and then you do make some kind of you know, stupid mistake. It's you know, bummer, not nice. That's all for data storage. Let's move to data tra like transmission because most applications today that uh, they not only need to store data, they also need to communicate with some kind of backend services with your backend services, with somebody else's backend services, but you know, it's a cloud world, so everything is interconnected, everything wants to talk to everything, everything else. If you have been in the industry long, you know, any non-trivial time, you probably heard the word transport layer security, which is TLS, which is a, the, you know, what became of SSL before, so SSL is not, does not exist anymore, so it's basically dead. It's uh, deprecated, so now uh, the same stuff is called transport layer security, TLS. And TLS is for TCP and uh, DTLS for UDP. Those are two industry standards uh, for securing data in transit. So this sounds like a good news, like, uh, you know, great, it works. We have a standard, so let's just use it. Well, not so fast. There are two problems uh, which are fundamental, actually, to this Okay, to this um, protocol. First one, TLS and the TLS, they both depend on certificates. And problem number two, both of those like fairly difficult to get right. Certificates is a major problem. Um, the way certificate system ecosystem works is that you have number of certificates, trusted certificates in in, I, in, in operating system, and uh, certificate for a given server, for a given website or whatever, it is deemed trusted if its trust anchor, you know, is one of those trusted certificates. The problem is, for example, iOS 9 contains 187 trusted certificates, and you have no control over which you would like to trust and which you would, would not like to trust. And there are all sorts of certificates there. So there are certificates from governments like Department of Defense, Netherlands, Belgium, telecom providers like Deutsche Telekom, and uh, hardware manufacturers like Cisco. You know, it may be, or I know, it depends on your application. Sometimes it's okay to trust all these guys, sometimes it's not, right? But unfortunately, there is no effective way to, to control this trust. For example, this is one of the certificates which is trusted by iOS 9. And it uses MD5 for you know, signature. MD5 has been dead for, I don't know, 10 years, something like that. I know that, uh, that hash algorithm on the root certificate does not, you know, does not mean that it is broken. But you know, it is 2015. And this wonderful certification authority thinks it is okay to have a certificate which is you know, signed with RSA MD5. Uh, I think this is something that, you know, a little bit questionable. This is another example of certificate from iOS 9 Trust Store. Fortunately enough, this is one of these always ask certificates. So if a uh, system will encounter this certificate, it will ask user if if the system should trust it, but we all know how, how users react to these questions, right? So they want to accept, access something, so they will, of course, um, in, in most cases, accept the warning. And it uses RSA 1024 bits, which is, you know, for a long time is considered uh, insufficient. Uh, common technique to overcome these trust issues is certificate pinning, and uh, I'm running out of time, so I will go really, really quick. So certificate pinning basically allows you to restrict trust anchors. You can specify, you know, uh, that you your application wants to accept the, the trust only from this certification authority or only from this particular certificate, and uh, it will fail for you know if your server presents anything else. Of course, there are problems with this, so it is harder to manage because you need to keep uh, certificate pins up to date. And if you rotate your uh, you know, server certificate but forget to update your pin in the application, then you created self-inflicted denial of service because your application can no longer access your own service because you forget to update pins. 
which is kind of bad. You probably don't want it. As an example, Apple uses certificate pinning for App Store and iTunes Store, but doesn't use it for, for example, iCloud backups and other iCloud services. Okay. Again, this is error prone, not only because of the denial of service, but because, and I have seen this personally more than once, when you implement certificate pinning, you override certain, uh, certain parts of the certificate trust, and it's very easy to mess things up and to enable trust where it shouldn't be. So basically what I've seen in the past uh, is that people were trying to implement certificate pinning, but instead they implemented it in such a way that application will trust everything including invalid certificates. And this is like, if you look at the code, it kind of looks, it kind of makes sense, but there are some uh, little details that you need to, to get right for this to actually work. Also, there was a public AF networking bug, uh, again, about six months ago, uh, where the code uh, was basically, I mean, there was a logical condition, logical problem in the code that implemented certificate pinning, and uh, that resulted in a, in a certificate valida validation bypass, effectively. Um, the last link here, TrustKit, is a relatively new open source project that you can use in your application to enforce to, to enable certificate pinning. Uh, it is very nice, so check it out if, if you want, if, if you consider implementing this, as it will save you a lot of time that you, that you would other, otherwise spend figure, trying to figure out in all on your own. Certificate trust is not the only problem, unfortunately. We have also cases of weak, weak cryptography all over the place. It starts, it starts with certificate signatures, so everything with uh, RSA signatures lower than two, two kilobits is considered is insecure. If certificate is signed using the MD5 hash function, it's also considered insecure. And uh, relatively recent, we had new cryptographic results for SHA-1, which hints that within the next few months, we probably will consider those uh, also insecure. All versions of SSL are insecure. TLS1 is also insecure. Um, and then we have, uh, you know, all lots of lots of uh, weirdness in the cipher suit. Cipher suit is a basically actual encryption that is used to encrypt the, the 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 data between the application and the server. And there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong uh, there as well. So there is a weak key exchange. For example, recent logjam attack on Diffie Hellman. Weak integrity. So cipher suits with MD5 are considered insecure. Weak confidentiality. Cipher suits with RC4 are, are considered insecure. Uh, expert. Uh, expert is a special uh, cipher suit. Uh, special cipher suits that were invented like 20 years ago when NSA was restricting export of the strong cryptography from uh, United States to other countries. And it turned out relatively recent, recently that a lot of clients still support this and they can be forced to use this weak cryptography. And thus, this will allow to basically break the TLS in practice, which is kind of scary. The good news is that since iOS 9 and OS 10.11, we have a new feature which is called ATS, App Transfer Security, which enforces strong TLS for you. It enforces those rules that are listed on the slides. I'm, again, running out of time, so I will not uh, go into much details. The, the important thing is that your application will simply refuse to connect to a server if uh, this weak cryptography is used. So application transfer security is available iOS 9, 10, 11. You can specify, of course, exceptions. So, if, for example, you for some reason need to talk to a backend which you do not control and you, which you cannot upgrade. You can specify this in, as an exception, and everything will still work. So, it's not it, ATS does not necessarily break all the things. ATS makes TLS misconfigurations easy to notice. This is very important because testing TLS text, testing TLS configuration, is actually a very hard problem in practice. With ATS, your application will simply stop working. So you know right away that something is wrong. So you can investigate, you can figure out what's wrong, you can fix it. ATS is great for security and absolutely use it if you care about security and privacy of your user's data. Again, this is a new feature in iOS 9 and I encourage all iOS developers 
to use it. I certainly encourage all iOS developers I work with to use it. Um, unfortunately, data protection doesn't end here. So once you send the data to the server, you have a whole new range of problems because you need to process the data on the server, store it on the server somehow, but this is a completely, completely different story and this is not what I'm going to cover today with this. This is it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Andre, for being with us and sharing your uh, precious experience with us. Let's see with if there is some uh, question from our audience. C'è qualche domanda dal pubblico? Per Andre? Sì. Ok. Fabio? Um, just one, one question regarding the TLS security of uh, iOS 9. Given that 90-90% uh, of the mobile application need to connect to a server that is owned by the same company that run and do the mobile application, um, does it even make sense to use the uh, iOS uh, TLS stack with all the trusted certification authorities and blah, blah, rather than setting something more statically configured, like uh, just building into the application, this is the public key of the server you are allowed to connect to, and that's it, just doesn't care. This is, this is certificate pinning, right? So it is, it is uh, of course, makes sense to do this if your application uh, connects only to your services, or if you, know, if you can manage these this con connections. The problems is that you need to remember about the fact that you have pinned the certificates because you know certificates they live for uh, two, three years usually, and then when the certificate expires, it is quite possible you know that the person who implemented pinning, you know, he's he's left the company, he's doing something else. Then you you know your DevOps they rotate the certificate, and next day you receive you know a million of bug reports that your application stopped working, so. Again, you need to handle this, this uh, with care. I personally think that certificate pinning should be done uh, for the scenarios like you mentioned. So, I mean, I'm doing this and I have done this in my previous uh, role. Of course, there are ways to uh, work around those, you know, those self-inflicted self -inflicted denial of service problems, but it's something that you need to approach with care. You need to document, you need to be aware of it. Yeah. and. I'm not sure that 99.9% .9 applications can connect only to the service uh, to the own services because everybody now uses you know various CDNs and all this kind of stuff. And if you try to render, you know, try to load anything from from web, it's it's very likely that you will have to access you know things like CDN or something like that. So it's not that simple as that, but definitely it's something that you, sh you should you should uh, try to to implement in the apps. Thank you. Vedo che c'è un'altra domanda. Dopodiché. Hi, uh, I'm not an iOS user, so my question maybe it's easy to be answered. The question is, from the user point of view, uh, is there a way in which I can check which kind of implementation has been made on the application uh, I'm going to download and use? Implementation of what? Uh, I mean the security implementation. So you showed us all the things a developer can make, but I say from a user point of view, am I able to understand which kind of features have been used by the developer? Usually not. Unfortunately, you have to trust uh, to ask your vendor the application authors the application vendors about this and uh, and hope that they you know tell you the truth this is why this you know security industry exists because we do we take applications we reverse engineer them and see if if what they do you know matches what the vendors promise usually it's 
doesn't, but you know, then <laughs> you you make nice nice talk somewhere else, and somebody you know the vendor becomes oh oh my god, so we don't want this bad publicity, so we will fix stuff, we will fix things, you know, security gets kind of better. No, uh, there is no effective way to. Um, to know which of those features uh, are used by application, unfortunately. Um, so it's always a question of trust, whether you trust what your vendor does or you don't. You, you can verify this by employing, you know, by doing reverse engineering of the application effectively, but that's, that's the only way I know. Okay, thank you. Bene, eh, no, non abbiamo tempo perché se no ci, ci troviamo poi in ritardo, almeno quanti di voi devono scappare perché hanno il treno? Noi avremmo programmato le 18, la fine dell'evento, ma stiamo sforando di qualche minuto, nessuno? Per cui allora la facciamo questa domanda in modo che, eh, ok, va bene, allora portiamo il microfono e... Eh, avrei giurato no. um, from an um, isolation perspective uh, when it comes to uh, applications uh, that let's assume I have uh, compromised an application and I get code execution on a system from that compromised application uh, what's the impact on the whole systems uh, in terms of what data can this application access? Can it access other data from other applications, from other context, other domains? So it depends on whether your device is jailbroken or not, obviously, right? Yeah, if the okay. device is jailbroken, then it's game over. So okay, nice. basically, the, the moment you jailbreak your iOS device, you, you can say goodbye to all the security. So, I mean, if you, if you jailbreak your non-research device, then you know, you're doing it wrong. So ne never do this, actually. Um, on, the properly, on, the proper, on the device with the proper security checks, if you get code execution in the context of the user application, you normally will not get access to any data except for the data of this particular application. OK, nice. So you get access to, to the sandbox, to the file system sandbox of this application. You get access to the to all keychain items that are accessible to this particular application uh, because this is also enforced by uh, code signing mechanism. And uh, jailbreak basically disables code signing. And this is why you can kind of, in the case of jailbroken device, if you get remote code execution in the context of the application, you pretty much can access uh, all system resources, all file system and all keychain items. So this, this is why you shouldn't do this. Thank you. <laughs> 